Hello, we should be live. Welcome to Reading the Room Live Edition. It's been a while since I've done a book club. So hello, everyone. We are here to discuss one of the most popular books ever, maybe. It's The Secret History by Donna Tartt. <laughs> and I have BookTube legends with me. So I want to introduce everyone. We have Anna Wallace Johnson. We have Biblio Sophie. We have CJ. And we have Pato. Thank you all for joining me today to discuss this the ultimate winter read. And I wanted to start this discussion by asking if it's your first time reading this book um, or if it's a reread and then general thoughts from you all about what you thought about it. So I'll just go this way. Pato, you wanna go first? Mm -hmm. This was my first time reading it and I was not disappointed per se, because I feel like that's too strong of a word out the gate, but this is like the quintessential campus novel or like dark academia like textbook basically and i've never read anything that's dark academia so my expectations were very high and while i did enjoy it it was very like wistful and like melancholic and like moody and there was like a mystery thriller element at the same time not sure that i am fully on board with the second half of the book i'll leave it at that <laughs> interesting okay cj yeah, this is my second time reading this. Uh, first time after my frontal lobe has fully formed. <laughs> so I think I read it at like 16 or something. And I agree. This was an interesting reading experience. I was pretty hypercritical of it the entire time, which I think comes with uh, being a book reviewer online now. Like you're just more critical of what you're reading in general. But that's not to say that I wasn't like addicted to reading it and staying up multiple nights late into the night to finish it and find out what happens next. Because I had absolutely no memory of the plot, the characters, anything that happens. It was very much so new to me um, on my second reread. Okay, Anna, what do you think? Well, first of all, you just posted a video that I'm very excited to watch. So I wanna make sure I plug that here. Yeah. Um, but I'm very curious to see what you thought about this. Thank you. Yeah, so I guess I should start by saying um, this is a very interesting book for me because it's set in Bennington and I am originally from upstate New York in a town that's like 10 minutes away from there. So all of these places that Tart talks about in the book, I, I know exactly where they are. I know all of these places that existed. I mean, she wrote it in 1992, so a lot of these places have closed. But for me, it almost feels nostalgic for a life that I haven't even lived. Um, but this was also my second time reading it. Um, this was, and I think you might have talked about this as well, Jalen. Like, this was a book that got me into reading again. I was just like, oh my God, this is doing it. Something's tingling. I don't know what it is, but it's doing it. And uh, for me, I love it. Like, it's cheesy in all the right ways. It's exactly what I want it to be. I read a lot of nonfiction, so I feel like I'm really critical of fiction books now. And while it's definitely not perfect in any way, shape or form, I think it's just so engaging and it just checks all the boxes for me. I hate a lot of the characters. I love some of them, but I'm into it. Like I'm an easy please, you know, when it's a good linear story, I like it. So that's how I feel. <laughs> all right, Sophie, what do you think? Uh, this is also my second time. I, much like CJ read it the first time when I was, I think, I guess, 18, um, and first started conservatory in Boston. So New England, extremely like hyper, hyper claustrophobic vibes in winter, I think. So kind of the perfect uh, setting in that way. Um, and I, what did I think? I don't know. I remembered it extremely well, actually, which is not necessarily the case for me. Um, so I was kind of like zipping through quickly and I don't know, kind of similarly critical of um, the, the characters a lot. Uh, some background on me is that I'm a huge Latin nerd. I almost went into classics. Uh, so not Greek, but like I'm, I can understand the appeal of such a, microscopic little club. I don't know. I don't know how I felt about it this time around. Kind of was amused and maybe bemused about it. 
Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll chime in too. I was a little nervous to read this. Like Anna said, this is a book that like, this was the one for me. I went to Powell's Books in Portland and I bought this like five years ago, I want to say, maybe not that long ago, but I could not put it down. And this time too, similar experience. I mean, this is not, it's kind of different from books that I usually read now, but I really, really enjoyed it. And I think the way that she is playing with storytelling throughout this entire book is just really fascinating to me. And I think it's really commendable that she's able to write a book that is just so propulsive and like, I don't know, it raises a lot of interesting moral questions. And I found them still to be very interesting on a reread. And I actually forgot about the ending with Henry. We're getting into spoilers, everyone. I think oh, most people yeah. have read this. Um, him dying. I don't remember him dying for some reason, yeah. which yeah. I don't know. That was the one thing that I totally, and I could remember even like the, the first lunch with Bunny and like pretty specific <laughs> shit. Uh, the former in the Dell, I remembered even, uh, <laughs> but I totally forgot about the like final set piece, which I have problems with. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say like that's also the thing where I was like, oh, <clears throat> oh, come again. Like I, 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 I don't remember that at all. I remember the. Um, how many, like, we're doing spoiler, like, 100%, I guess we just gave it away. I yeah. remember the incestuous relationship, really, like, that was, like, the one thing that totally stuck out in my head, because it also is, like, brought up, and then just, like, you know, it's just, like, brought up all of a sudden. I mean, I guess it's alluded to, but um, that's the one thing I really remembered, but, yeah, the death at the end, I was, like, oh, okay, how well did I read it the first time? <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, even with like the incestual relationship, I remember CJ, we were talking about this and I forgot about that too. When she meant she read it before me on the reread. Um, but I, even when I was reading it, when Buddy was like making fun of them for it, I thought he was just being an asshole, like trying to poke fun at them, but then they actually were. And I was like, that's wild. Um, and then no one it, cared. But... <laughs> yeah. yeah. And they were like, sick. We love our incest friends. That's a recurring theme though, is that, and then yeah. no one cared. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like a beautiful representation also of just how incestuous they are without literally being incestuous so it's just like everything is smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller because the like the relationship that henry and bunny have is also very very tiny and claustrophobic and then obviously the siblings and their special thing and Francis and his interaction with literally everybody he has ever come across. Um, it's very, very peculiar. Mm -hmm. One question. So I'm just going to ask like the most obvious question here. Would you push Bunny? And you have to get an answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Ooh. for sure. I'm pro <laughs> Bunny. Um, Oh my God. Yeah, probably. Oh. <laughs> I mean, okay, everybody else say theirs. Let me ruminate on it a little bit, but yeah, probably. Yeah, I think no. I would too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We need somebody to have like a moral high ground too. Yeah, no, I, I, I wouldn't do it. I, I honestly, I'm not even gonna be a moral high ground about it. I think I don't have it in me yeah, yeah. to kill somebody. Yeah, in like a fictional world, maybe I would. Real world, no. Well, do we think do we think any of them other than Henry actually wanted to go through with it? Because I don't think Richard want. He was just a bystander, you know, but he was still complicit and not stopping it. So it's weird that we're Richard is our narrator the entire time, and he's like the least memorable character for me by far, yeah. which is probably on purpose obviously um it's just kind of this omnipresent witness to this thing that he walked into um yeah i would say almost everyone except richard is probably pro bunny murder in my opinion i don't know if they can really i mean obviously no we know that none of them can handle it apart from henry everybody comes apart at the scene probably i think i mean henry is the only one who is actually by his own um admission sociopathic but richard to me is a close second i i get some real like the 
such big comparison because of the Brett Easton Ellis and Vaughn and Hart connection. But I don't know. Richard, it seems like a total cipher and not just because like he's, it's not just because he's our eyes into the world. Like he, he's fucked up in California. Why the fuck does he want to go to this school apart from just escaping? Like he's constantly, he's nothing. He's completely lost. So I don't know. I could, I could see him following along to the murder, maybe just like with the, the second most amount of zeal in, in his own way. I don't know if you agree with me on that one. Yeah. It, the like cult dynamics in this book, he's like a willing cult member. You know what I mean? Like he's searching for any kind of meaning and order and direction in his life, which is why he's fallen into this microcosm of crazy dedicated people to each other so i feel i feel like he, he's he's that desperate for a purpose in anything he's convinced that he wants to kill bunny too and i don't think they actively want to kill bunny i think it's self-preservation right it's like they they want to avoid any uh responsibility or repercussions from what happened in the woods with the farmer and that made me think too, like even with the farmer in the woods, and I, I don't know what it's, what it's called, a bacchanal, I don't know if that's the right pronunciation, but one question I always have, or the both times when I was reading this is, do you think that that experience of them sort of being like outside of their bodies and just murderous, was that a real thing for them? Or was it an excuse for them to like justify an aesthetic experience of that being fully immersed in it or something else um, as like the sort of justification for then murdering Bunny as well? Yeah, I mean, I think they're like, <clears throat> I mean, for me, all these characters are just not real people, you know, they just, everything about them is just, um, uh, what's the word that I'm looking for? Uh, it's not authentic. They're not, like, in a normal day society, I would look at them and just kind of cringe. Um, and I think that they are so transfixed with each other and the movings in around them that this whole thing of them killing somebody in this ritual that they were doing it uh it's all just a, like a disguise for it you know like they they went crazy they went crazy and they thought that they reached this nirvana but they absolutely did not if that makes sense yeah it's like group psychosis or uh -huh. um drugs like the mm -hmm. only i i like underlined very few parts in my reread but this is the description from charles of the the night it was heart shaking glorious torches dizziness singing wolves howling around us and a bull bellowing in the dark the river ran white i'm like you guys <laughs> you guys pump the brakes what was happening <laughs> what drug was that <laughs> It's just Bennington, I can assure yeah. you. <laughs> well, exactly. Actually, I think it, this is just like a more extreme distilled version of the campus in general. And then yeah. like Richard, when when Bunny goes missing and there's this like mass hysteria, because everything progresses so quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, and he says like just how much the campus was prone to hysteria anyway. And the brief little glimpses of the other groups are also a bunch of outsiders. And oh, yeah. there's, a, I, there's such a insider outsider thing happening. And so like there are the insiders within mm -hmm. the, the campus, but they're also definitely outsiders because they are not taking any other classes. What do the other students think of them, right? Like this like weird little group of greek scholars um <laughs> and so yeah it's like i feel it's exactly as you say on it it's just it's bennington or it's like it's mm -hmm. college experience right it's yeah. like oh i'm gonna, <clears throat> i'm just gonna do this and it's it's gonna be a heightening of me in some way and i think it was really funny how after bunny dies like the rest of the college then feels like they had some big connection to him and like they all start grieving immensely even though they were kind of like putting them to the side, you know? I do think it's really representative of the very weird experience that is college. Um, but I mean, in terms of like Bunny in particular too, I think Donna Tart is doing some interesting things with how she, like through Richard, is kind of spinning different perspectives on him. And even Richard, he says that 
there's one quote where, that I marked down where he says, reading back over this, I feel that in some respects I've done Bunny an injustice. People really did like him. And so we never really know who Bunny is other than from what Richard like portrays him as. So what did you make of, I guess, the focus of Richard portraying him and then how she sort of shifts, I guess, initially I, I like Bunny to start. And then as we get further on and his behavior becomes increasingly more annoying and rude for lack of a better word. Um, like, what do you make of all of that and his characterization? I felt that it showed kind of like the, the guilt that Richard was going through throughout the novel, because initially there's like this sense of like rose tinted glasses, like bright eyed wonder at like all of the world and this group and like this sort of aesthetic that they represent whenever he's like outside of the Greek class, like when he's outside of like Julian's kind of instruction. And then once he's like in the midst of it, you see these like larger than life beings kind of brought down to size and see how flawed and like damaged they all are and like the way that they interact and from there like the way he recounts the story changes a lot in terms of like characterizing not only like himself but all the other characters in like a much more negative way constantly and i felt like it's because like later on in the novel it's like after you know central action of like bunny dying it focuses more on like the emotional like responses and like i said like the grief of that and i feel like changing the characterization to me felt like very intentional of showing like his mental state yeah. bunny is really our connective tissue i mean he's the person who brings richard into uh the club uh, but he's also the one who has the most dealings with the outside world and richard i guess um, there are kind of dual outsiders and entryway, but he has an outside girlfriend. He he's like like a good boy, um, so he probably does have more of a footprint in the campus than any of the rest of them do. Um, and the kind of like, if anybody is hearing anything about the club of Greek scholars, it's probably from hanging out with Bunny at a park and mm -hmm. Bunny not being able to this time about literally anything yeah i think he brings us back to like this normalcy you know we're so caught up in like this just moving through of these glamorous people and he's very normal like he played sports and stuff and like he comes from this weird kind of like waspy family um not to say that they probably all didn't but um he just like i don't know brings in this like very average kind of in a way like we question why he's there um, and it, it, I don't know, it feels a little bit more human as much as he's dislikable as the novel progresses. But I think agreeing with Pato, like he shows this regret, like it, it helps show this regret that Richard has about being involved in it. And, um, it, it, again, the whole murder, you know, it's within the first sentence of the novel. So it shapes the novel, it is the novel, and we kind of forget that he's a human, you know? Mm -hmm. Like I immediately jumped on being like, yeah, I would kill him. But like, what, you know? Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, and I think it just makes it very human that even though he's repulsive in these instances, he, he is real and he connects us, like you said, to everybody else where they just feel really secluded, this group. I'm just kind of like formalizing what my question or thought about this is but bunny is the one with a lot of like weird homophobic you know he, right he is that one yeah. is there something i mean the rest of this cast is like openly queer or queer coded or you know not hetero <laughs> um i wouldn't call incest queer I'm making that clear i'm not saying that i'm not avoiding that um but is there something about how he was treated in response to that being the basis of like where the other characters are operating from did anyone pick up on anything smarter than what i just said about how bunny is treated yeah donna tart is on her homophobia vigilante shit killing off bunny no i think i i have sort of similar and also similarly like not fully realized thoughts I do feel like Bunny is a, um, a sort of sacrifice. Um, perhaps that's why he's named Bunny, after all. Love. Uh, 
Damn. But he's the normie man, right? He is, uh, he is the American man. This takes place in 83, 84. He is like the white American man. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, everybody else is definitely either actually queer, gay, or definitely queer coded um, in some way, outsider coded, even though they're all like white rich people. So they're not super outsider. There, there are different shades of outsiderdom. But yeah, I think Bunny gets punished, I think. And that's also why probably Tart makes him so in, kind of increasingly um, a buffoon. He's a sort of like lovable buffoon at first, but he gets to be kind of dangerous. Like he's racist, he's homophobic, he's not great. And he kind of does represent that like Reagan man, I, I think in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I guess going to another character here too, I think Henry to me also plays an incredibly important role in this book in terms of how just generally mysterious mysterious he is about the whole thing, even to like the final page of the final dream. Um, I guess throughout the book, what did you make of Henry as a villain, I guess? And second question, do you think this novel could still be successful if told from his perspective? Because I do not, but. Henry is my boyfriend. Henry is <laughs> absolutely the boyfriend character in this book for me. Um, a problematic fave for sure, but that's who I latched onto, especially as a 16 year old. And then I'm like rereading this. And I'm like, ew, this forms some weird shit in my brain <laughs> at an impressionable age. Um, but that's how I feel about Henry. <laughs> He's my boyfriend. Well, I mean, Henry is daddy. Like, Henry gets shit done. You yeah. call him when you're in trouble. Um, yeah, I don't know. Well, so one scene in particular that I think about a lot, like, I, I went back on Reddit, and I remember years, this is years ago, I made a post on, like, r slash books about this book, because I was, like, so obsessed with it. But anyways, I was asking about like Henry's relationship with Julian and when they have that weird like meeting in the hallway when they when like Julian like leans in and like gives him a kiss or something like on the cheek like they have this weird connection that is not fully I guess revealed and I, I'm just wondering how that also factors into how it played out in the end when Julian kind of lets them off the hook and everything and then he flees um Julian's another interesting character that we don't see a lot of in the book but is important Yeah, I was kind of surprised at how little Julian played into it, especially because, like, the first, I don't know, like, hundred-something pages are focused so much on him and, like, the visits, like, in his office, like, forming, like, the entire basis of, like, what the year is going to be, etc. But in terms of, like, him and Henry together, it was something, I, I kind of just overlooked it, to be honest. I personally didn't gravitate towards Henry. I don't think I gravitated towards any characters, to be honest. I, I found them all to be kind of trite in, in certain ways. But I don't know. Did Henry seem put together? He almost seemed like he was just putting on this like facade through like unemoting of like appearing to be put together. But like, I mean, to go to the extent that you would kill yourself, obviously something was like flawed deeply, like behind the scenes. Yeah, but I could fix him. <laughs> True, actually, I didn't consider that. I was put on this earth to do that. Yeah. <laughs> you can fix him. It's yeah. fine. Um, yeah, I, I definitely agree with that as well. Um, for me, Henry, he scared me from the beginning, um, which is, there's definitely something attractive about that, right? Um, his relationship with Julian, I, I, I can't stand Julian. I think he's manipulating these children to live a life that he wanted to live. He glamorizes everything that's, you know, affluent and beautiful. And I think that he encourages these kids to do things that he could have never done. So as a mentor for Henry, I think it's really sad. And I think Henry is constantly trying to impress him. There's one scene in the novel when um, Richard comes up to Henry and Henry's gardening. And like he asks, I forget exactly, I should have underlined it, but he's talking to him and like Henry's like, now I feel like I can like, 
like I'm unleashed or something, something along those lines. And it's just like so scary. I think that this was always in him. I do think that he was kind of the ringleader for it all. And everybody was a little scared to dethrone him, including Julian. Um, I think he was just a powerhouse. Um, and uh, if the book was written in his perspective, I don't know if it would have been as successful though. Then it would have been American Psycho. And it yeah. Been <laughs> yeah, that's true. Right? It yeah, that's true. I think yeah. That's, yeah. I think 100%. I love I love the Don and Tart Brett Peace and Ellis of it all. Like trying to find who who each one is in these characters is really fun. Which makes me think about Camilla, who's our only woman in this whole book, right? Mm-hmm. Did you guys have any strong impressions of her and the role she played in keeping this group together? I felt bad for her. Like, I felt like she was just, you know, there was a comp weird competition for her. And then, you know, the guy who got her won. And then it was like, you know, that was, I think the only thing, like the ending I really forgot about. And I think it was just because it wasn't as impressive as the rest of the book for me. Um, and I think a lot of it played with her character as well. I think a lot more could have been done with her. Just not so timid, not so reliant. Mm -hmm. um, which I guess, I don't know, was the vehicle that she was, but I think more could have been done with her. Yeah, it was kind of bizarre how she, for the most part, like, existed to just be like kissed by a different person and like whatever scene was going on, it was like either Charles or Henry or Francis or Richard himself. It was just like, who is she? Because there's always just this veil of like unemotive, like gray eyes just gazing out into nothing. And it's like, this is this is like a scarecrow, like a mannequin, just like that they're all just taking turns kissing and it's kind of weird. Yeah, she's really underserved. I think it, part of it is accidental probably, but part of it is purposeful of that, like she is the only girl in the group and um, it's probably, only because she is sort of the plus one of Charles, I think. I think this is definitely like a boys club and she's the only woman. And she is, yeah, she's just like the permanent muse, I guess, for all of these dudes uh, in some way or another, like the, the protective vessel. Um, and yeah, she gets, I also dislike her. So I'm as bad as everybody else because I'm super put off by her and the kind of like, Bootsy stuff and like Richard regularly saying that she didn't give up her femininity um, and like the way that she dresses and I'm just very put off by her. I think I was most put off by Camilla and Charles. Like they seem very, very difficult to understand to me. Yeah, and I think like her character, her characterization really is interesting because she's also a twin, which I think is really intentional on Donna Tartt's part to sort of make her in like in the shadow of Charles necessarily, but also from Richard constantly like objectifying her even to like the end of the book where he like randomly asked her to marry him. I thought that was so like bizarre and just delusional of him to think that she would, I don't know, maybe I missed something there, but I, it was just so odd to me, but I think Richard is a lot to blame. And I think Donna kind of lets that mystery be a part of Richard's narration. And I mean, I just think it's, this book kind of reminds me, I've been reading some books this year with like passive narrators where the story is mostly just different, I don't know, sources coming into our narrator and we don't get a lot of like Richard either. And I think it's interesting how that can be a choice for a writer to like explore what's missing in different narratives based like rooting it in one certain character. Um, so I think it's funny how we attach ourselves to certain characters or dislike certain ones because of that and how this book could just be different if told in a different way, whether it be third person or from someone else's perspective. What characters do you like, actually, if any? I don't like any of the class. I like the, oh. like, um... Judy! Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Judy! I, wait, I literally wrote on my Goodreads view, I was like, she stole every scene she was in. I, I was loved like, her. <laughs> the the what did she do after like aerobics uh, yes yeah cable aerobics she's like take my car take my car what do you need loved her oh i liked francis too i liked francis you know i just wanted to give francis a hug i liked francis yeah, yeah he's he's going through it yeah but judy 
like the French professor academic advisor. <laughs> oh, he's afraid to lose the job. Just don't tell them. He's don't. also weird. Like everybody is yeah. treating these. There, there's there's the hierarchies of how people are treating people in this book is very telling. Actually, I it feels true to life. Um, coming from a small institution and also completely inappropriate. Stop telling these like young adults any of this shit. I liked uh, Bunny's parents too. I, I, I liked that whole post funeral scene in the basement sleepover. That was like one of the most fun parts for me to read was just how incredibly panicked everyone was during that time and I just had such a great sense of that home and like who those people were. Um, I thought that was really well realized. Bunny's family is a horror movie. Yeah. I just, like, this is where I do not understand at all how families interact. I don't know this. This is a life I do not understand. It's amazing though. I mean, her writing for me is I can envision every single thing that she talks about. I know exactly how everybody looks. I know exactly, like, this is the most vivid experience for me that I've had in a while mm -hmm. um, with reading a book. And that's why I think I like it so much. I just like, I, you know, it's a thick book and it's written well. And it's just like, you're just sitting there and you're driving, you're driving. And it's just like, you don't know how you got home but you know that you experienced it and it's like all in the recesses, you know? It's crazy. Like I, I know what her, I know what Bunny's dad looks like. I know that man. I know what the mom looks like. I know everybody. Judy, Judy Poovey, um, <laughs> she I want to play her. Yeah, I hope. I, I just know that she's constantly wearing spandex yeah. and like high socks, you know? <laughs> Our close personal friend. Yeah. Has anyone else read her other books? Yeah, I was goldfinch pilled for sure in high school. Like right after this, I was like, oh my God. And I think it had just came out. Um, and I loved that book when I read it for the first time. And I, I was like trying to remember it and read the synopsis after. And I feel like I would not like it now, but there's something there's something tantalizing about her, huh? She She can really weave some weird shit together. And then I know our friend Kieran, who's in the chat, is a big um, The Little Friend proponent. He's always trying to get people to read that. So really? definitely, definitely <laughs> on my radar. <laughs> I also read Goldfinch. I've never read Little Friend. Uh, and I think the same as you. Like, basically, I, I was like, oh, there's another one from her. I should read this one as well. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty similar. It also follows a nothing white dude yeah um who is a cipher for other crazy things happening around him so i don't think i would reread it however yeah it's even longer than this and... it's even longer yeah <laughs> i'll definitely read her like next book right i know the meme is that we're due for another dawn and chart soon so i'll keep up with it yeah, I'm, I'm wondering what she's gonna, you know, explore next. I know she's very like Dickens influenced, um, so I'm wondering if mm. it'll be in similar style or something completely new. I don't know. I will be reading it as soon as it comes out for sure. We should reconvene everyone for for that. For another yeah, book club yeah. Um, it'll be like 1,500 pages because I think they just get longer and longer and longer. So no big deal. I mean, what do you? I guess general question about the book too is why do you think this book is so popular? Mm. I think, Why did this one work? I think that it has to do with like, like a lot of you guys said where you read it like before college. I feel like if I had read this when I was younger, or like in high school, not even like to say that if I was less like immature, but just if I had like this abstracted idea of what college was going to be and I read this, I would have liked it a lot more because so much of like the campus aspect of like this exclusive group that i'm now a part of and like the super cool teacher and everyone's mysterious and what wears all these outfits and like everyone knows each other and there's parties all the time and it's just like blah, blah, blah like larger than life it is like 
so like heightened and i feel like if i didn't have an idea of like what college already was which is not this book like for me i felt like a disconnect reading it now because i was like oh it's like it's like fantasy this is like fan fiction almost of like what college is like going to be so i feel like reading it like before could have been like so like formative to just like the sense of like wonder and just like buying into things like further And in a similar way, also um, an era that doesn't exist anymore, the 80s. And this is the, like the very end of a sort of analog time where this is like the end of a 60 year period of basically the elite being pretty similar decade to decade. Like this could be um, the talents of Mr. Ripley also. It, there's not really a discernible difference in its vision of modernity um, versus something that's taking place on a, on a campus in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. So you're getting some like infusions of decade, decades and decades beforehand and there's this melting pot and it can really only happen up until the internet and cell phones. So there's something that is Actually, a fantasy is really the perfect world the word, excuse me, because it's very much a fantasy world of something that couldn't exist at all, I think, at this point, where it, something is quite so exclusive and exclusionary. And class. I mean, I, one of the reasons why it gets, I think, read all the time is, is class panic, class consciousness, class... Um, interest and just like poking at really weird things i think it has for me i agree with everything everybody's saying fantasy big one i think it also is the age of the characters as well because it's an age where and i was watching something about euphoria so like this is where i this spawned this idea but Euphoria, they're in high school, right? So everything feels like really, really gross and weird. But this is something that they're older and they're old enough to make decisions. And like everything that they're doing is within an age group that's like, we can all relate to that, right? And it's like, it's a time for change for us. And uh, so where was I going with this? I don't remember. Um, so yeah, it just feels like we can all relate to that age group and everything. and. Uh, I don't know. This just feels like it has like a luxurious feel to it. Everything feels like, you know, you're shopping at Fifth Avenue. Um, it's something that's so out of reach for me, but I can engage with these people and this this time that doesn't feel real. Uh, I don't know. It's just they get away with murder. <laughs> they get yeah. away with murder. You know, and they're playing with all of these devious things. You know, there's there's attraction. You can create these characters to be as attractive as you want them to be. And more often than not, you are attracted to one of the characters. You don't know who, um, but you, you find these things. Um, and again, they're so intelligent, right? Or they seem to be so intelligent. They're studying this language and they speak to each other in a different language. And it just feels like it's so unreal but it's very real you know to a degree and i think that that is why it's so uh popular and yeah their ages like their ages everybody's been through that age probably or is going to be at that age when they read this book um so yeah disregard the euphoria reference i don't know what i was talking about it's there. actually funny that you mentioned euphoria because i pictured henry as being nate from euphoria oh no. like jacob Velarde. Yeah, no, like that's what I was like, picturing. <laughs> Absolutely, and it's it's what you say. Like it's it, they are young enough, and yeah, young and hot, yeah. but yeah. also like old enough. And it's mm -hmm. it's that perfect like Goldilocks porridge where they're not children; they're adults, but they're also like they're not adults yet. Mm -hmm. so there's this like magical little bubble of what college is kind of pretended to be, yeah. um, in which like there is no outside world. And it's gritty, but it's also completely devoid of real consequence. Mm -hmm. No major responsibilities yet, you know? No. Just life and death. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
let's play with it you know i i remember it being like more glamorous than it ooh, my dog uh than it was on my second reread like the things that were most opulent to me were like these sick lunches i was like damn the food descriptions in this sound great like that was that was the thing that was like most special to me and also the fact that no one had to like work that was that was where the richness came into me and i guess the the summer house right that whole setting of like being able to access this this space with seemingly nothing to give to it up front it's just like available to you and your friends to crash on but like they lived in meager apartments like i i don't know i i remember this like the wealth discrepancy um it, it wasn't as impressive to me the second time which was interesting i guess i think it's interesting interesting too thinking about this book as like a coming of age story and that richard's reflecting on this time in college and like even that summer where he's in that like warehouse or whatever sleeping in the cold and like, oh, almost yeah. dies like i think all that is such such a good like novelistic i don't know it feels very classic in that sense of like how she frames that from a narrative perspective um it's interesting to think about her influences on the story and how she sort of like modernizes it in a sense but i like that section of the book too I that, is, that is literally my favorite part of the book so, i don't know why but i i love that every time it's tangible like you yeah. can when he's walking home and he's like so cold and you just you feel it especially if you've spent any time in cold climates in um in the winter and then it's just like ah, all of me is so uncomfortable for about 30 minutes that i have to spend outside what if this were just constantly and constantly the case it's very dickensian um yeah it just and it's just so evocative and he writes it super well that the snow coming into the 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 room through the room. That part to me almost felt like Murakami esque, just because it was so like steeped in like isolation and like yeah. it was very like blending into like the surreal. Like most of like his dreams do later on, but in this there was like, the sense of like reality, like the borders between blending and like hallucinating during the day or like going to sleep and like re not remembering waking up or seeing someone standing in the corner, like stuff like that, where it's like so steep and like just this sense of like just vast open like snow essentially just for miles like walking back and forth i i really like that part of the book too well i think it's also like this turning point right like at that point he literally has the elements working against him but still he wants to stay like he has to prove that he has to stay within this realm and like in that moment he could have kind of gotten out right but there's just something like he refuses to tell his friends that he isn't up to their par of you know vacationing and doing those things and he could have had this avenue i mean it was kind of handed to him to be like i i'm, I'm I, I physically cannot make it anymore and he decides to stay within it mm -hmm. one question i do have since you guys have read it more than once how much like of like the whole like Chekhov's gun sort of stuff do you see leading up to it? Because even reading for the first time, I was like, oh, that was very like heavily foreshadowed, like redeemed repair, like making a resurgence, like in the sort of like new cycle that follows like the death or like the gun that Charles uses, like being the same gun that they use like on the house, like little details like that. How how much of it did you notice like the second time around as being like, oh, I know where that's going? Zero. Zero. <laughs> really? I, I wouldn't say I was like critically reading this book at all. And I don't think that I have those uh, cultural milestones embedded in me enough to be able to look out for them. Like, I, I know what they are, but they're not something that I'm like actively able to grasp enough to track um, in a foreshadowed sense. So I was like, mm. damn, this is crazy. <laughs> I, was, I was completely surprised. <laughs> You're just getting on the ride. It's just like, I, totally. I was buckled in. I'm like, all right. Henry's driving and you're just in the car and you're like, man, I, this is crazy. We're listening to Joy Division. Also, Henry is not Nate from Euphoria. Bunny is Nate from Euphoria. Bunny's blonde, though. Yeah. I think Nate is blonde from Euphoria. Not, he does not, not have dark me. hair. I don't know. Oh. Really? And Henry is super, super tall. He's and like stoic like, and just has like yeah. a chiseled jawline all right we can find about who we're casting <laughs> later i guess 
Also, I kept forgetting that Bunny was like six foot three and like a quarterback. A hundred percent agreed. I like, I have a vision in my mind of something totally different, and then they give the like obituary, not the mm-hmm. obituary, but when they're looking for him, and I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. Were you picturing kind of like a dowdy, rotund dude? Not even no. that. Yeah. And the audiobook, I, I don't know if y'all listen to it also, but there's like such like a seedy voice. It's like almost like Bugs Bunny. Like it does not give off like <laughs> high school quarterback, like six foot something. <laughs> yeah, I loved her voice for, for Bunny. Alex, Bunny's hot confirmed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the voice, it's so funny to listen to. Um, I mean, I want to know what you all think about this. Do you Do you find this book to be... I guess we were kind of talking about this book with some levity, I guess, but I found this book to be incredibly horrifying on a reread, thinking about what's going on in this book, like, objectively, I suppose, and Bunny's plight and everything. Like, I don't know, do you consider this, did it affect you, I guess, emotionally reading this, or was it kind of more of an aesthetic experience of reading, like, a a murder mystery? Because for me, I found it to be really jarring by the end of it, with, like, the final dream with Henry, um thinking about Richard being alive and him being dead now and how that all kind of plays out too. What do y'all make of that? I think in the second half, it started to like hit me in different ways when he's Richard is like talking about how like much he regrets joining it all. And like how it's like the part where the Julian's like left and they have to get a new instructor. And he's thinking about like, what he's going to do like after he graduates or how he has to do another year. And like the sort of like real life aspects of like paying for tuition, blah, blah, blah where he's like on his own like that was the part that sort of like sunk in for me because I feel like so much of this book is to a sense like unreliable because it's so biased to like his perception of it where he doesn't care and like while he's like recounting the days after killing Bunny or like knowing what the murder he's just like it didn't affect me as much as I thought it would and you know it didn't really change my daily life so you're sort of forced to see like the repercussions of like everything through like a very uninterested sort of like disinvolved lens and until like that point i felt like that was like one of the first moments of like oh maybe maybe he's not okay or like maybe like things aren't you know peachy keen but aside from that i don't think i was like as affected by like the murder itself there didn't i don't know maybe that's like one of like the bigger issues i had with the book but it it did feel like so like inconsequential like the, that they just kept living completely normally afterwards which i guess in a sense is like the horror of it but yeah and i think i asked that too because there's a lot of like references to crime and punishment by dostoevsky which kind of plays into the like the internal i guess horror that you feel after you commit an act of violence such as this and he gets away with it for so long in that book um but yeah like even with this is an interesting question why was bunny so upset on ruining his friendships and blackmailing them i thought about this a lot as in terms of why his character sort of shifted and my initial thought I think is that I think he sort of felt left out of the of the murder. Do you agree with that? Like he wanted to be a part of murdering the farmer. Like maybe yeah. he doesn't think that literally, but I think in in him he kind of feels like he's not like the rest of them in a similar way to Richard goes, is. I think it goes back to what Sophie was saying about like the last wave of this kind of men. Like he was always othered from them and and through his normalcy and through his like bigotry of upholding american values in this period of time like that that like he wanted to ruin them because those things came to fruition and he was able to like see the differences between them more clearly i think i think there's something about bunny being straight laced and the rest of them more on the verge of whatever they're on Mm -hmm. that resulted in the magnitude of those feelings of um being left out like he's not only left out from the actual scene of the crime and this thing that like brought them together more than anything else could because richard was left out from that too you know what i mean and he's he's fully committed to the bit at this point of protecting them at all costs i think it has something to do with like those those more deep down differences that um maybe weren't as apparent when they first met and were in this program together and it has to do with the fact that he doesn't belong to their class. I mean, I think it's really Julian's fault that he is in the class, the like the lower C class of Greek, but he isn't actually patrician like they are, and he doesn't have the funds. 
And so it's constantly, he doesn't belong in terms of his upbringing in some ways, but he just also fundamentally doesn't have as much money as Henry. There's constantly like the nouveau riche of Henry, but he has so much money that it doesn't matter. And he has so much culture and he's so weird that it kind of doesn't matter in some ways. He can like, he can be top of the food chain through just brute force, I guess, and money. Uh, but then the twins obviously have a, uh, an old money connection and Francis is the most old moneyed. Um, and it, there's such a like constant hierarchy of who's important, who's in, who's out. And they're constantly infighting. And I think Bunny is the perfect, well, Bunny and Richard are the two representations of like constantly grappling with trying to fit in and Bunny in some ways should fit in perfectly and does, but also I think is keenly aware that he doesn't have the, the goods and I there we see this sort of like reactionary backbiting that happens and it's just interesting too because obviously like bunny's like literally like othered from them in the sense that like he was left out of the murder that takes place and he, like they literally show up like on his doorstep covered in blood like without him and it's like us and then you and it's like there's like a divide between them but at the same time, Bunny and Richard are both left out of that. So they're like equal in that sense. And so from there, I think is where like the sort of like inequality stems from Richard being let in by Henry and by all the others on what they had done and, and then what they were going to do and like being involved in their, their plans after that, where Bunny and Richard were on the same level and then Richard gets chosen over Bunny. And there's a sense of like obvious like disconnect between them. And from there, I think like Bunny's like, sense of revenge takes in of like you've wronged me not only by like excluding me but also like you've chosen someone else when like we have all this time like we live together etc and then from there i think like this sort of plan to take them down to like his level is like comes to fruition is he the youngest son that sounds Don't right remember. yeah i think so because there's also like i think bunny has never really belonged in um the circles he was supposed to like he shouldn't be in this greek class he has trouble learning greek he has like probably dyslexia or something he needs help studying um and i think he's probably felt constantly inadequate and been bluffing his way through um belongingness for a really long time anyway intellectually and class wise so yeah, it's like all the cachet he had to wager with at this institution and with this group of people has run out and he has realized that to like the full extent and it causes him to tip to the other side. Relatable content, you know, who hasn't done that? <laughs> oh, Bunny. Do you think Bunny from Mona Awad? <laughs> You should have asked that, Jalen. I wonder if, I wonder if like the title "Bunny" and naming the boys "Bunny." Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I should have asked that. God damn it! Um, <laughs> but I mean, I do see a lot of parallels between those two books in terms of having yeah, like, a lonely right? character at the center who sort of loses her mind. Yeah, I mean, I bet it was. I would I would guess it it was an inspiration, but. Oh, I mean, also that goes with like also his being an outsider. He's constantly infantilized. They all get real, like, adult names. He's funny. He, probably also by his choice in the way that... I'm, I'm sort of speaking as an outsider, but in the way that I conceive of strong American men who have names like Biff and things like this. I don't know. You, like, keep your um, high school quarterback nickname until your 40s, and everybody's like, yeah, that's, that's an old trip who's fun guy no maybe yeah, yeah. Really biff bunny and trip it's a trio. <laughs> so i know we're coming up on the hour i do love the cast question to round out a book club so let's cast everyone so we have some dis uh, disagreement over henry but what about bunny if we had a pick hold on i'm getting up my imdb <laughs> yeah 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 this is <laughs> important <laughs> Bunny is um, Taylor Swift's boyfriend. Thank oh. you. I was just going to say that. Yes. Is he? 
I, I can't, I don't know. I can't, I don't know. I think I so. Know. Sure. Yeah, I think so. I'll For blonde, it. yeah, blonde, totally. That's oh, the only okay. I haven't seen this guy, yeah. I can think of. Like, he's not Alexander Skarsgård, so he's Taylor no. Swift's boyfriend. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Taylor Swift's boyfriend starring as Bunny. That's, <laughs> that's the name. Is he in normal, uh, in not normal people? Yes, normal people. No, Bob not one. normal people, conversations with friends, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, Camilla. Emma Corrin. Okay. I could see them. As Doable? That. Yeah. That's, I just pulled up IMDb and they were on there, so. Okay. <laughs> I was like, I think it works. Yeah. I could see that. Doable? Trendy? Blonde. Like, into it, you know? I think it fits the aesthetic. Sure. Charles has red hair, right? Oh, they both have, yeah. Do they I both thought, have red hair? I think Charles is blonde and Francis has red hair, right? Francis. Yeah, Francis. Francis. Yeah. Oh. Charles might be Taylor Swift's boyfriend, too. Okay. <laughs> Play yeah. both yeah. roles. One man yeah. show. It's just Taylor Swift's boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> probably has the real name. And um, it's in a black box theater, and he has a stool, and it's just, that's it. Changing I mean, for him. <laughs> <laughs> I I picture like for Francis like an Eddie Redmayne sort of totally. character maybe totally. Well, he's not like the most attractive they say, right? Like, I mean, I, Eddie Red like they're all attractive, right? They're in Hollywood, but they I said he looked like a fox. I think is how yeah, they, they said like him. a fox yeah. and like yeah, he's like very like he's yeah he's thin and pointy yeah, mm. so attractive to me, but yeah. yeah. I'm like into it. Yeah, that's what I go for for anything. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know though. Yeah, Eddie Redmayne. Can or the see. guy, the older brother, the Harry Potter older brother. The, yes. Yeah, not yeah. the twins, but the older one. The one married to Floor. That's my vote. The other <laughs> redhead male ass, you guys. <laughs> yeah. There's only two. And what about Julian? Ew. Ooh, so many, so many good ones. I was, Stanley oh. Tucci. Evil Stanley Tucci. Ooh. <laughs> I was who, for Garber. Ooh, I like that too. What about, uh, who's Maggie Gyllenhaal's husband? <gasps> yeah. That he, guy. Oh, ooh, he's so good in like everything he does. What, what's his name? Isn't he a Skarsgård brother? He, he's, he's a Skarsgård, but I don't know if he's a brother. Oh. He, he's a Skarsgård for sure. Okay. There's too many. I don't know who's related, who's not. I almost said Jake Gyllenhaal, but I think they're brother and sister, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. more ancestral. So, they're <laughs> playing Camilla and Charles. <laughs> well, oh, Peter Sarsgård. Yeah, yes. not a Skarsgård. Different. Oh, a different Sars. Okay. Yes. Sorry, yeah, sorry. him. He is playing Julian in my world. Okay. Judy Poovey is um, <laughs> uh, Jenny Slate. Anna. No, it's, it's, Anna. <laughs> it's Anna and Jenny Slate. And Jenny Slate, yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah that's, actually, that's excellent. That's excellent. Uh, what about Richard? Oh, yeah. I forgot about Richard. Oh. Yeah, because he's a nothing. Right. <laughs> Taylor Swift's boyfriend. Yeah. <laughs> Who is He's blonde, he? right? I imagine it was a brunette, but I, is it specified? He's from California, so that means oh, he's blonde. Oh, yeah, that's it. You're right. <laughs> they should put like a different wig on him for each yeah. character and have him play them all, you know? Who is, work. in my mind, I imagined him as the, uh, did you ever see the movie Dunkirk or the Netflix movie where like the Black Mirror where you choose your own episode? Sure. Mm -hmm. I, I envisioned that kid in my, or yeah. like somebody, Kind of reminiscent. Of Harry that. Styles. Yeah. Oh yeah. Did anybody see? Don't worry, darling. I mean, that's I totally off. Yeah. Wild ride. <laughs> I want to go to there. Yo, I mean, decorate my house that way. But that's yeah. about it. <laughs> I am shocked this hasn't been made into a movie. I wonder yeah. why. That I is, was wondering but... that. Too. I read an article about it, and the film rights have fallen through a few times and Gwyneth Paltrow and her brother were set to produce it and I think star is the twins at one point is this after Royal Tenenbaums because I'm also 
Gwyneth Paltrow, well, I mean, it would have been after anyway, but Gwyneth Paltrow's character in Royal Tenenbaums is kind of giving a little Camilla. Yeah, that's true. You know? A little. Well, everyone, I just realized it's fun. Do you have anything else you want to talk about before we sign off? And then everyone go watch Anna's video. I'm going to do oh, that after this. So. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> And any other videos anybody makes, but yeah, I mean, if you literally want to see, it's it's crazy. She writes like, spoiler alert, but she writes. I mean, just like random one-off things. Like, there's a moment where she literally writes the tasty freeze across the street from the veterans' home, and that exists. Wow, it exists. You just turn and it's right there. It's crazy. So, yeah, it's cool. <laughs> That'll be fun viewing for sure. And I mean, I'm being serious. Whenever she publishes her next book, let's reconvene because I will be reading yeah. it instantly. Um, but I want to thank you all for joining me. This has been, I've been so excited for this, like so excited. Um, so yeah, it was awesome. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Um, thank you. I will sign, make sure you follow everyone as well, everyone watching this in case you don't already. Um, but thanks everyone, I'll sign off here. Bye. Bye. Bye.